This is part two of the latent heat videos, and I'm going to pick it up from page two of 7.1 latent heat. Um, right down at the bottom of the page, it actually gives you a definition of what latent heat is. It's defined as the heat that's required to change the state of one kilogram of pure substance. So um, in terms of converting between um, different states, we have latent heat of vaporization, which focuses on um, the transition between gas to liquid, um, as you can see here, I've written that down for you, um, as well as actually converting between solid and liquid, and we call it the latent heat of fusion. So there are really just two names for latent heat that um, considers the changes between um, the two different states. Uh, here in this table, I've got a list of a whole bunch of uh, materials that have various latent heats, as well as various melting points and boiling points for your reference. Um, those melting points and boiling points, are obviously, at um, atmospheric pressure. Now is probably a good time to talk about, um, is it possible to change um, at what temperature things boil at? Um, this is an interesting premise, because if you um, have read any um, books about people climbing uh, Mount Everest. This will be an interesting one that, that they might have mentioned that you can actually boil water on Mount Everest um, at a much lower temperature than 100 degrees. Uh, and that's essentially what is happening with boiling itself. So last video, we talked about the fact that fast molecules are leaving the liquid. And so therefore, the average kinetic energy remains unchanged, even though you're putting in lots and lots of heat energy, um, but you're constantly also removing the fastest moving molecules or the ones with the greatest kinetic energy. So therefore, the average kinetic energy reduces. When you're on Mount Everest, however, um, there's a key, key difference compared to um, on sea level, and that is actually um, how much space is on top of the liquid when you're boiling something. Um, when you're up on Mount Everest, you are actually um, higher up in the atmosphere, and so in terms of the liquid being able to leave um, or particles being able to leave the surface of the liquid, it's going to be a lot easier um, up at the top, top of Mount Everest because there's just less air particles in the space above to stop that from happening. And so therefore, if the particles leave a lot more readily, then you'll get that process of boiling um, at a much lower temperature. The flip side of that, now some of you might have parents who love to cook, or if you love to cook, um, you might know of a device that actually allows you to speed up cooking. So I'm talking about um, a pressure cooker. So that's um, actually a device that artificially um, traps the steam as things are boiling inside, uh, inside the pot. So literally it's like an artificial uh, clamping device that stops any steam from escaping. And so you're actually doing the reverse of what happens on Mount Everest because if you can trap all that steam in the area that's right on top of the liquid, what you will do is actually you fill that space with a lot more particles than it would normally be around. And so now the really fast moving molecules that normally would have been able to leave um, at standard conditions now can't because there's a lot more vapor on the top. And so you essentially you'll get um, particles that can leave only when they have way more energy. So a pressure cooker um, is actually something that you would want to use to, let's say, make braised beef. Instead of having to do it for five hours, it'll just be like an hour because you're actually getting the liquid in there heated up to way over 100 degrees. Obviously, there are safety issues uh, with pressure cookers as well um, because uh, obviously a lot of pressure in a very small space um, is is not a great idea. Um, there are safety features built in, so there's a special way to open these things so you don't release all that gas in the one go. Um, obviously, that would be an explosion of some sort, um, but that's an interesting um, thing for you to have a think about um, as well. Um, of, of course, pressure cookers have also been used um, in other nefarious schemes as well, uh, which we won't talk about. Um, in the video, but you can have a think about what might be another thing that you might want to control pressure. So um, now that we've got um, all these big giant list of values, um, you'll notice that I have an equation in the notes that shows you what you need to do when things change state. So the formula is really easy. Q is the heat um, that's put in. Um, there's a little bit of a typo, so that, that really should have been Q. Just change that for me, please. Um, so that should be Q. 
um, is the amount of heat that's required to change um, M, amount of uh, materials um, between states. So it's ML. Um, the L depends on whether you're going from liquid to solid or solid to gas, um, and that would be either um, latent heat or fusion, which is the column on the left, or uh, latent heat or vaporization, which is the column on the right. Um, I'm, here's an example, um, just some really basic questions. So this is, I guess, what we call a C standard question. Um, so read the question first, um, highlight the key points. So how much energy is required to raise the temperature of one degrees, oh, sorry, of one kilogram of water from 10 degrees to 110 degrees. Recall that uh, the specific of water are these values, steam is that value, assume that it takes place in a closed system. Uh, first thing that you should do is it, what's in the yellow box, which is to write down what you have been given. And once you've done that, um, I've also taken the time to write down also realizing that it's actually the latent heat of vaporization because I'm actually trying to describe um, the transition from liquid water at 10 degrees to steam which is above 100 degrees um, so you need to realize that i guess the problem can be solved in three parts so part one is actually trying to heat the water up from 100 degrees or from 10 degrees to 100 and then part two is to turn the water into steam so that's the latent heat part of it and then step three is the steam heating up from 100 to 110 while we're here, it's probably good to point out that um, getting burnt by hot water is pretty bad, but getting burnt by hot steam is even worse because hot water has a fixed temperature of 100 being the highest temperature, but steam can go way above 100. And by the time the steam comes into contact with your hand, it's so more than often than not, you get burnt with steam if you're cooking and you reach your hand over a pot and that's boiling. When the steam condenses on your hand, the steam turns into water, thereby losing energy. Well, where's the energy gone? It's actually gone into your skin. And so if you think about it, if the steam's boiling off this liquid and it's at, let's say, 120 degrees, because steam can be above 100, a lot of energy is actually being transferred. In fact, if we look back at the latent heat of vaporization, um, the value for water is actually um, 10 times greater to turn from steam to liquid or liquid to steam uh, compared to when we go from solid to liquid. So it's times 10 to the 6. So that's why it's really bad if you do get a burn with steam. So uh, um, if you have a look, it, all I do is just the heat input must equal to the amount of heat required to bring the water to 100 degrees. I've kind of tried to split this up and worked step by step here in the solution for you. Um, and then I've got the temperature, or oh, sorry, the amount of heat energy required to turn it into a change state and then from steam to 110 degrees and I've broken that down and I've written it in every single um, I guess substitution that I could think of into here there and that's just working out for it. Um, key things as to why this naturally even this question is actually straight away a B standard question is because it actually involves multiple parts and also multiple units. So we did specific heat capacity without considering a change of state. Now I'm kind of putting the latent heat stuff and the specific heat stuff together in the one. And so this naturally makes it a bit more complex, but it's not that challenging. Um, example two and three are more challenging. I'd love for you to have a go now, now that you've seen example one explained. After you've had a go, then you can watch part three of this video and I'll go through how I solved example two and three.